I think the mould was broken. I don't think you will ever see at Linfield or Glen Torren another Roy Coy. The man is an absolute legend. I think it'll be very hard for what he actually achieved, not only with Linfield but in Irish League football, ever to be surpassed. Roy had more self-belief than anybody that I've ever seen. I mean, Roy never had any doubt in his ability. There's no such thing as, uh, as being second. He was a hard taskmaster. I think probably a lot of players at one time or another all hated him, but all of them, to a man, will all respect him. He made us winners. It was all about winning, and we've all got the medals to show for it. In the history of football in Northern Ireland, there's never been anybody quite like Roy Coyle. Not only did he play for Belfast's biggest two clubs, Linfield and Glentoran, he also has the unique distinction of managing them both. And his role of honour is truly amazing. The man, known as the gaffer, won 50 trophies in a career spanning three decades. He's simply the most successful manager Irish League football has ever seen. Roy Coyle was born and raised in East Belfast, a footballing hotbed which produced the great George Best. Like many teenagers growing up in the 1950s, Coyle's talents were forged on the city streets. It's been 30 odd years since I've been in East Belfast. Certainly where I was born and bred has changed, it's been redeveloped, but um, you don't forget those things, it's uh, something I always cherish. And growing up there, uh, playing around there, and seeing the old houses again, you know, the, me the memories keep flooding back. All you wanted to do when you were young was play football, as uh, simple as that. Uh, you thought one day maybe playing for an Irish league club at Linfield or Glen Torn. Obviously East Belfast, yes, those are the two clubs that you, would, you dreamt of playing for. It was during his days at Orangefield School that Roy befriended a young man who had become a music legend, Van Morrison. Van's mother and my wife's grandmother were sisters. Oh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Small world, isn't it? Isn't it? We would have walked together, barely spoke. Uh, he was, had no interest in football. I wasn't really interested in music at that time. Um, we just said, see you tomorrow. Broke off and, you know, he's, he's just a really down to earth guy. But we went different ways in our life. He became very, very successful and I was a bit fortunate to, to have achieved something too. So it was nice that two working class boys could have achieved so much in life. Like I love you now in Orange Spirit. The Belfast boy had a Ballymena man to thank for his start in Irish League football. I came uh, courtesy of Jackie Fullerton. Jackie was playing against uh, Ballyclare Comrades and I was playing for Ballyclare. And there was this ginger haired lad, Coyle, and I've still got the marks. He was tough. My goodness, he was tough. But he, he could play a bit as well. And then I signed for Ballymena United in the close season, and the manager, Alex Parker, at that time, he needed a midfielder. And I said, have you seen the boy Coy at Ballyclare? I think Jackie then went on honeymoon, and when he came back, I was in the changing room. 
And I said, what are you doing here? And he says, oh, I signed a week ago, so that's one of my claims to fame. Coyle eventually moved to Glentoran, where he won a first league title, and after two years gained a dream move to full-time football in England. But it all could have been so different. I was working part-time at the Royal Victoria Hospital in the casualty x-ray department, and the girl came down and said to me, there are two gentlemen to see you uh, up in casualty. And I went up and uh, the two gentlemen were Tommy Morrow, who was Glen Torn centre forward and was their leading goal scorer, and Roy Coyle. My wife and I and my young family were talking about going to Australia uh, because I became disillusioned. I felt I can't get the full-time football that I desired and wished for. So what I, I did, I got the two lads, I spoke to them separately, and I sent Tommy Morrow out to Sydney, and Tommy had a wonderful career out there and is still there to this day. But as history shows, I sent Roy Coyle to Sheffield Wednesday. They asked me if I'd come over for a two-week trial, and uh, they sent me just over a week into that two-week trial. So all my dreams were fulfilled. Do you remember your best goal? I do because I didn't score that many. I think only scored about four or five in England. But the best goal I scored was one against Chelsea in the FA Cup. Good play again by Henderson with Sissons now for Sheffield Wednesday. Oh, and there's a chance now. Kyle and a goal! It was about the edge of the 18-yard box and it was across and then came back out and it just hit it on the sort of volley and it flew in. Unfortunately, we lost the game 2-1, it was the FA Cup, but uh, that's a goal I always cherish. In the same year, 1973, Coyle won the first of five caps for Northern Ireland, alongside future international manager Brian Hamilton. A chance for a shot here. And he hit it really true. The country calls, you don't even have a second thought. It's the greatest achievement that uh, can be bestowed on any footballer. And uh, the only regret I had, I never played in Belfast. We were having to play all over the place because of the troubles then. And Coyle did leave his mark on one of the world's best players. Eusebio sending Jennings completely the wrong way. I was detailed to do a bit of a marking job. And um, I sort of mistimed my tackle with Eusebio. And uh, both of us fell on the ground and were getting up and he, he spat in my face. And, Obviously, it didn't warm him terribly well. Um, but about 10 or 12 years later, uh, Linfield were playing in the Stadium of Light against Benfica, and he was like their PR or something. And uh, I was nearly in the middle of a team talk, and he wrapped the door, and the door opened, and he came. And he just went over and shook my hands. He said, I'm sorry. And I just said, oh, I apologise for the tackle as well. So I think we, we made up. Coyle may have missed out playing for Northern Ireland here in front of his home crowd, but he was soon to become a permanent fixture at Windsor Park. Aged just 29, a surprise phone call led to a controversial move back to Northern Ireland as player manager of Linfield. Initially I was a wee bit shocked because I didn't really endear myself when I left Northern Ireland to go to Sheffield with uh, Linfield supporters. Um, I think they were reflected in how I played when I was at Glen Torn. I would have called it competitive, people would call it something different, you know, and I know a lot of Linfield supporters that uh, didn't, didn't warm to me, um, but whenever Linfield come knocking your door, I'm sorry, and I don't care whether you play for Glen Swan or who, but you've got to answer that knock. What was the expectation level? I just happened to ask them, what is this expectation at Linfield? Said, well, all it is is you've got to win the League or the Cup every season. I went, yeah, thanks. No, no pressure. Jim Lemon, former Larne player, with the throw. And Macklin leaves it, and Whiteside, and Eric McGee! And it's, it's in the net! And there it is! What a surprise opening to this game! But at the start, things Eddie didn't go according to, to plan. The box, swinging it in, and there's a chance for Printer! And it's there! Ken Barkley dropped that ball! 18 months of uh, complete misery and agony. Uh, obviously the well documented one was uh, losing the Irish Cup final to Carrick Rangers Connor giving and we lost 2-1 that was arrived in November 75 and we lost in April 
1976. Gary Pinter scores! Yeah, that was that was one of probably the worst day that I ever remember playing for Linfield. Um, I remember after the game, Roy and I just sitting in the bath at the Oval, and we were just sat there after all the guys had got out of the, out of the bath and, and sort of spoke about it. And you know, and I, I think, but I as a captain, him as a manager, it was one of the worst experiences I have ever felt. I, I know from speaking to him that it was a defining moment in his career. Uh, he often talks about it that when he does win or when he did win things with Linfield or indeed Derry City or, or Glen Torren and even Ards in fact um, he always reflects back to that day because it, it made him very humble and in the sense that it produced a, a determination The second year again we lost the cup final to Colgain 4-1 at the Oval the goalkeeper. And Moffat sends it back now to Liam Beckett but Beckett tries a shot and it's in the net I played in both those cup finals. But fortunately enough, after the cup final against uh, Coleraine, we played Glen Torn in the County Antrim Shield final at Windsor Park. And I think the scoreline was 3 1. And I think that was a turning point. Uh, and Linfield board then decided we'll give this man another chance and they extended my contract. And what a decision that proved to be. Under Coyle's leadership, Linfield won 31 trophies, including three Irish Cups and 10 Irish League titles, six of them in a row. Good evening. Good evening. Do you want me for something? Yes, please. Yeah, that's great. Super feeling. Delighted. Uh, they've had a hard season. They worked hard, I think. I don't think anybody will deny them that they deserve at the end of the day. What would you put the, the secret of that real success down to? Good players. No, it's a, you know, everybody said, well, probably to a degree, I played a part in it, but uh, I think the, the one thing about management, identifying good players and then keeping them motivated. Murray lofting it for Rafferty. 3 1! Roy had more self belief than anybody that I've ever seen. He, there was no such thing as. Uh, as being second, it was just well, he was focused on success. Lindsay McEwen then keeps up his record of scoring in every Irish Cup final he plays in. Uh, every manager has to have that little bit of uh, gap between him. Normally, his number two would uh, would act as a go between, and he would always, the manager would always keep his distance, but. Uh, he got round that by uh, us having a, a week away together if we'd done well in the domestic and we'd go away to Spain for a week and that was one heck of a week I can tell you and you got to know the manager a little bit but you still never knew to go over the line you never crossed the line to try and get in and get to know the man personally because he always kept that distance <laughs> One day out on the park here when we were playing and he shouted out to me because had made a mistake. He said that I would never play for Linfield Football Club again. And he was probably right. I probably never did, but the supporters would probably say I'd never played for them for a long time anyway. But no, we'd had our fallouts, but at the end of the day, he was the boss and you had to respect that. He made the decisions. He put you into play and you, and you had to play for him for the 90 minutes. He was a hard taskmaster. I think probably a lot of players at one time or another all hated him, but all of them to a man will all respect him. He was a fantastic coach. I could have heard a pin drop when he was coaching 11 to 11. And he could have corrected things from a Saturday out there out, uh, on the pitch there and then. Um, his other big uh, quality, I thought, was was collectively motivating a group of players. He had he was absolutely superb. He had he came in and gave concise information. He didn't waste words, and uh, he had people you know pulling the change room doors out to get down to get out. Roy Coyle's successful reign at Linfield wasn't without its problems. The signing of two black players caused controversy. But it wasn't the colour of their skin that was the problem. There was what they call trial games in Belgium. And there was two players, there was uh, Tony Coley and Kamal. Uh, one from Senegal and one from Casablanca and uh, there were two black lads and I watched them play and I thought they would do a job and no, no problem back home and we brought them over and it all sort of broke about the 11th of July I can still see a billboard 
and the billboard was Linfield have signed a Catholic and I was wondering who the board had signed behind my back I thought they'd signed something that I didn't know about and the, apparently some press guy did an interview with Antoine Coley and Antoine was a Catholic I had no idea because he, he was a black lad from Senegal and I didn't know what sort of religion that you know those people were coming from and there was a bit of a protest at the time but I have to say I think it's the best thing that ever happened to Linfield Football Club because it did open the door <laughs> that there broke the mould and uh, as I say there's been a lot of outstanding uh, Catholic players signed for Linfield and have been very much the forefront of the success of Linfield so perhaps a, a bit of an unwritten rule at that time don't sign Catholic players for Linfield Football Club I think yes I think I think probably too they were maybe protecting the Catholic players because maybe coming from West Belfast or wherever North Belfast you know maybe they would have got a lot of abuse too signing for Linfield Football Club which is predominantly known then as a mainly a Protestant club but you know it probably was an unwritten rule but there was never anything that uh, at that particular time that the board came to me and said you cannot sign a Catholic. They never said that to me in any shape or form. But uh, no, Antoine Coley, or Tony as we call him, uh, he, he proved a massive asset. After almost 15 years, the master tactician's days were numbered at Linfield. The gaffer's record-breaking reign came to an abrupt end. It has been mutually agreed that Mr Coyle's contract with the Linfield Football Club be terminated forthwith. That is the end of the brief statement. It did hurt. Uh, I'd, be, I'd be telling lies if it didn't, because I thought I'd, I'd pull the club round. I thought I was managing it quite well. I think everyone's entitled to a bad season, um, but um, the supporters thought change was necessary, and uh, we decided to park company. Coyle went on to manage Ards and Derry City. He brought success to both clubs before a move back to his beloved East Belfast. When Roy Coyle arrived here at Glentoran at the end of 1997, it rocked local football. Having won every championship and trophy with Linfield, he now had his sights set on trying to do the same with the Blues' bitter rivals. It was a shock move that initially was unpopular with the fans in the stands at both clubs. It was a new win situation because when I went to Linfield, you know, I was a Glen Torn man. And when I went to Glen Torn, I was a Linfield man. So I'm going, in my head spinning here, what's going on? But again, it was a football decision, solely and purely a football decision. I played for Glen Torn and knew everything there was to know about it. And again, when Glen Torn, you know, come knocking on your door too, you just can't say no. It's as simple as that. <laughs> We crossed a very difficult divide in the city. Um, some people would say, and, and on both sides, no matter where you're coming from, the Oval or from Windsor or vice versa, you're going to be a bit of a, a traitor. He brought with him that drive for success and winning habit, going on to become Glen Torren's most successful ever manager. That's a good strong run from him. I think he just had that aura about him and. You know, obviously we knew, we knew of his record before, he'd won trophies. Um, to be fair, you know, he came to the Glens and as I said, we were, we were down at the bottom of the league, there was only one way to go, which, which was up. But he did seem to um, bring a new confidence and uh, you know, a new professionalism to the club. And the players, everybody took that on board. And everybody, you know, there was no one taking their place for granted in the team, which might have happened before. Uh, I think he, he maybe dropped John Devine in his, his first or second game and that was a big statement to send out to everyone if he's going to drop the captain no one's going to be safe players would have been fine for being late or for dress code or um, one of the, the, the rules that uh, Roy implemented when he came, first came was you had to call him boss or gaffer which was, was different for a lot of the players and uh, I can remember Michael Cash former Crusaders player was there at the time and he couldn't get out of the habit of, of calling the gaffer Roy and even when Roy said call me gaffer son he, he would have said okay Roy. He brought standards 
And those standards weren't just for a Saturday afternoon. The standards were from a Monday to the Saturday. So when the game was played the previous Saturday, Monday night's training, Tuesday night's training, Thursday night's training, those standards had to be maintained. I can remember uh, playing East Belfast in a County Antrim Shield game. I remember it well because I missed a penalty and nearly hit the shipyard cream of the penalty and uh, I went off injured. And we just managed to scrape through against East Belfast. Uh, and I can remember the gaffer coming in after the game and finding the whole team because the performance wasn't good enough. Had a, an aloofness from the players at times. At other times, you've seen a human side to him. First year he came to the Oval, uh, my mother had gone for a liver transplant on the uh, on the Tuesday leading up to the final. So I was off the radar for a few days and obviously with a, a lot more crucial things on my mind. And uh, I came back on the Thursday night and uh, I remember he, he pulled me over in training before training started and he said, how's your head? And I said, I'm fine. And he says, right, you're playing on Saturday. And that meant a lot to me because he could have took me out of that game. But uh, he always had this insatiable appetite for, for winning, which never changed um, right to the end. And I think... If you ask any player that played under him at Glen's Horn in, in my time, and they'll, they'll all say that you know he made it, he made us winners. It was all about winning, and we've all got the medals to show to show for it. But like his time at Linfield, eventually the fans were calling for his head. I'm not one to hang about if, if you're not welcome and people don't want you. What's the point in staying? Because uh, the abuse will get worse unless you, you turn it around. But you know it's only going to maybe turn around for a period of time because nobody can go on winning forever. It's, that's a fact of life. And uh, the boo boys may be at bay for a period of time, but they're sitting waiting just for it to turn again. And I thought, well, you know, my stage in my career, I didn't think it was right uh, to continue. And uh, the then chairman, Stafford Reynolds, and I just agreed to parting the way as was right for uh, both Glenn Torn and myself. Through his illustrious career, Coyle has rubbed shoulders with some of the game's greats. One Manchester United legend who scored against Coyle's Linfield at Windsor Park in the 1980s was back in Belfast recently. Brian Robson was here to present the gaffer with a footballing lifetime achievement award. Somebody dedicates their lives to uh, football, which is obviously been great for myself, and uh, you know, for me, all kids want to be a footballer. Uh, so, if if you've dedicated your life uh, to football and to sport, uh, then when you pick up awards like this, you should uh, really enjoy that that moment. He's won more trophies than anyone else. He's uh, managed both both by two teams. And he's won trophies at them all. You know, so uh, he's. And in my eyes, and I'm sure the other players' eyes, he's a legend as managers come, you know, so he, and deserves everything he gets. He's a, a man manager, he's a, he's a leader of men, he, he knows what he wants, directs people, tells, kicks him up the back to when he has to, but he, he gets the results and that's what, what matters at this level. Well, what Roy's done for local football has been unbelievable, you know, I, I think surely if, if, if at the outset Roy thought he'd achieved of half of what he, he has, has done, he would have been more than happy, but... I mean, he's without a doubt the best manager that we've ever had in the local game. But what he's achieved in the game has been absolutely remarkable. He had an insatiable appetite, you know, to win trophies. Um, he, he lived and breathed football. Great tactician, very, very good coach, and his contribution has been quite remarkable. Where's the ball? Come on, get the ball. 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 
Yes, I go. Yes. How do you feel about retirement now? How are you dealing with it? Do a lot of walking. That's for sure. And uh, a great grandson who takes up quite a quite a bit of my time doing that walking or in the back garden kicking a ball with him. Oh, to go! <laughs> yes. I think yes. identifying when time is right to go is important uh, in any walk of life. And I felt when you know you get over sixty years of age that you've fulfilled everything that there is to fulfil. Possibly, you think maybe well, you know that desire and that drive is starting to wane. Those steps are getting more difficult each season. <laughs> it's nice that I can go now to games with an objective look and watch football and enjoy football as opposed to be focused just on one team. There's no question that one person is more delighted than I am in the pack than that's my wife. Well, when he was winning, it was very good, very pleasant, very nice. But then there's the other side, bad result and weekend ruined. What changes have you noticed in Roy since he's retired from football? Well, he's a lot easier to live with. We can plan ahead if we want to go out on a Saturday night. We don't have to stop and think, oh, who do we play this Saturday? Is it an easy game? Is it a hard game? So we can just have nice weekends. But looking back, uh, you wouldn't change it, I'm sure, as uh, what, he, what he's done in football. Oh, no, no. We've had a great life. I think some journalists wrote that uh, there's a possibility that I can go back into management. I can state quite categorically there is absolutely no chance of me ever come back into football management. <laughs> Well, I'd say 